Sure. My passion is to help encourage young children to follow their dreams. What were your dreams when you were around my age? I was torn between test cricket and and being interested in public policy or politics. So that's what I was interested in when I was your age. Mm -hmm. And Liam? for me, when I was seven, I wanted to be um, a pilot or I wanted to be on Young Talent Time and sing like Jamie Redfern. But then by the time I was 13, I'd worked out that I wanted to be a journalist and then go into politics. And what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, I want to be a marine biologist and a vet. Good. Both very important careers mm. and very important work. How do you imagine it would be to fulfil those same dreams with the pressures of today's environment and the pace of change? I think, I think there's always challenges. It doesn't matter whether you're a seven-year-old in uh, 1891 or you're a seven-year-old in uh, 2019. There's, um, you've always got to deal with whatever you are faced with in the era that you live in. But the one thing that you can always control is who you are and your standards and your morals and your ambitions. Uh, Leon and I have an extraordinary obligation upon us um, to make sure that in our natural environment for the areas that we're responsible for, we leave it in a better state for people like you. Mr Bignall, you are obviously passionate about saving the great Australian bite, as am I. What is below the sea is, uh, is unbelievable. 85% of the marine life that is in the great Australian bite and around Kangaroo Island isn't found anywhere else on earth. Now if that's not worth saving, I don't know what is. How do you think this will unfold in your opinion? Do you think we'll succeed in saving it? I'm an optimist. I think we will. We've had some big victories in the past down my way. We, we stopped urban sprawl around McLaren Vale and Wollonga and McLaren Flat. And what I do every single day is just get in there and fight for what I think is right and what the people in my area think is right. And what we think is right is to save the bite. Uh, Leon and I would certainly be in furious agreement that no one wants to see any animals killed in the bite um, or unnecessarily anywhere else. I think again um, what we're seeing with the fight for the bite is um, I get around to a lot of schools and speak to a lot of parents and it's the students, it's the grade fives and grade sixes and grade sevens who are coming home talking to their parents about the perils of drilling in the bite, which again, I think is a terrific thing. Kids have so often led the way in recycling at home, in turning off the water at home, in turning off the power at home to, uh, to reduce energy use. And um, I think this is a perfect example of that at the schools I go around to, where this is a big discussion and you can make a difference. Is there any other reasons that you're refusing in your minds that you don't want the bike to be oil drilled besides the animal? And I think the other consideration we need to give to drilling in the bite isn't just about the animals, but it's about some industries that are already existing, some industries that have a very small footprint on our environment. And those proponents, those people who are pushing for drilling in the bite are saying, you know, it will lead to 600 jobs and it will lead to money coming in. Well, we've got a tourism industry that employs 47,000 people. In the five years that I was the tourism minister, we, we grew the um, amount of jobs in the visitor economy by 6,000 people. Now, there's 6,000 South Australians who've got jobs all around our state. And in terms of economic prosperity, it's now worth $6.7 billion a year to the South Australian economy. And tourism is one of those um, industries in South Australia that is highly contained around our coastline um, and does employ people in all of our regions. The other industry that I was also responsible for as fisheries minister was the fishing industry. And again, we could see a whole lot of um, people put out of work and small towns right around our coastline um, become ghost towns if there's an oil spill out there. I, this, this is all risk and no reward for the people of South Australia. Yeah. We lead the way in South Australia for so many things. Can we lead the way for Australia? I think we can. I think we can in so many things. And we've already seen it in um, the, the trajectory we put our state on in terms of renewable energy. Um, we've seen it in terms of our ambition, which is now being translating into the new government's ambition to be the focal point of our space agency here in Australia. And uh, that's a terrific thing that gets bipartisan support. Our shipbuilding capability is something that we should all be very um, proud of. And when we talk about our premium food and wine from our clean environment, that's something that 
politicians have been a part of for over 150 years in South Australia. They've brought in fruit fly acts, they've brought in acts of parliament to stop these little grubs coming in and eating all of our vineyards. They did that back in the late 1800s. So um, I think governments have always worked closely with, uh, with food producers to make sure that we have the best. And um, we're also the only mainland state in Australia that remains GM free, where you can't grow genetically modified uh, crops. So I think in, in that food space, we lead the way in defence, in um, uh, in renewable energy, and so many other ways we we do lead the nation, and in some cases we lead the world. I mean, when uh, when we had uh, our big reform on uh, renewable energy here in South Australia, Elon Musk and the rest of the world set up and took notice, and I think that's great because we used to do that back in the 70s and the 80s, and uh, it's great to be in a state that leads the way. Thank you so much very much for talking, taking the time to talk with me today. You are the custodians of the children of today's future and I take comfort in your obvious dedication and comfort commitment to the task. Thank you very much Isabel. I really enjoyed uh, having a chat with you and thanks for your, uh, your confidence and great questions. Very, very impressive indeed. I have a surprise for you both. May I please shut your eyes for a moment? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's not like a jellyfish or something. Okay. It is. <laughs> jellyfish. <laughs> Spiders. Spiders. Just kidding. Snake. <laughs> and your eyes are shut. My eyes are shut. I'm alright with snakes. As long as really? I can see them. Yeah, not with my eyes. But you sure this isn't some sort of uh, hidden camera? That's uh, right. That's right. That uh, we're going to end up on uh, <laughs> some TV channel. Peter, you can open your eyes first. I'll let Isabella take over. Okay, sure. You have it beautiful. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, I'll turn you around. Yes. Oh, wow! It's a snake, isn't it? No, it's not a snake. No. I hope not anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty cool. That is amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> take it. Jeez, I've lost about 20 kilos. <laughs> so I like the way you paint. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> and we were glad you still had the beard. Yeah, I know. So was I. <laughs> yeah. I just look at that. That's it's current. Uh, can That's I outstanding. Thank you. Yay. That is, um, <laughs> let's go. Let's, let's say, Isabel. Dead ringer, guys. 